Good morning and a very warm welcome to Sunday Live. Today we continue in our series on Lamentations and Peter will be speaking to us about that from Lamentations chapter 3. We have our visit to virtual Sunday school and we also have our birthdays this week. And following uh, Robert Finlay's final Sunday with us last week at the Heart for Harlow prayer service, um, I thought it'd be good to show this week the tribute given to uh, Robert by Bishop Peter. So welcome to Sunday Live. Our risen Lord Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his kingdom there shall be no end. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of God's peace using live chat. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is written on his hands, my name is hidden in his heart. me to depart. No power can force me to depart. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The special prayer for today. Almighty God, you have knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your Son, Christ our Lord. Grant us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those inexpressible joys that you have prepared for those who love you 
Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Virtually at home together to thank the Lord all together now. Here we are all together virtually at home together to thank the Lord all together now. Stars of old times are NHS Celebrities are now worthlessness If you have a million it can't save your life Many people risk their life to keep you safe Drivers, police, doctors, nurses, care homes alone Protect every person you are helping low Answer our prayers now and evermore Father, heal the world now and evermore. Here we are, all together, virtually at home together to thank the Lord, all together now. Here we are, all together, virtually at home together to thank the Lord, all together now. Your grace is all we need, always Lord, any situation need your mercy, Lord. Commit everyone in your mighty hands, heal us, protect us from COVID, Lord. We rebuke COVID-19 in the name of Christ. Name of Christ now and always amen. Now and always amen. Here we are all together, virtually at home together to thank the Lord. All together now. Here we are. All together, virtually, at home together, to thank the Lord, all together. Thank you for your offerings to the work of St. Mauls and St. Mary's, and you will find details down below as to how to make those. Thank you as well for those who've contributed for the new microphone. This will enable us to have a higher quality of recordings when we record in church, um, avoiding too much interfer interference from things like helicopters when they fly over uh, and uh, lesser things as well. So that should make a huge difference. Thank you so much. We have a couple of volunteers or so um, who would like to start work um, on the garden at St Paul's, uh, beginning to tidy that up and to make it eventually into a therapeutic garden. Um, we need some tools for this, so if any were able to donate some tools, um, do please let me know and I can make an arrangement to collect them from you. Uh, any garden tools would be absolutely great. And in addition, if anyone has a, uh, a lawnmower, um, a manual lawnmower that we could make available, that would also be most helpful. We want to help all our premises to be our best for God. Thank you. This being the first Sunday of the month, let's share birthdays together as we sing together happy birthday and do please um, own up if you've got a birthday on live chat so we can wish you a happy birthday
And now following Robert Finlay's final Sunday last week, let's hear Bishop Peter's tribute that was shared then at the Heart for Harlow prayer service. Robert, it's really good to be with you, albeit online, as we celebrate your ministry at this time, as sadly you prepare to leave us as chaplain in Harlow Town. It's my massive privilege to say that goodbye on behalf of the wider Anglican Church in the Diocese of Chelmsford. And although our paths haven't crossed very much recently, I've seen in the past, live, face to face and online, just what a tremendous ministry you have exercised as you've served Christ and as you've served people across Harlow down these last years. What you have done and achieved has been truly groundbreaking in so many different directions. Your ministry has been exemplary and transformational. And it's just built about and out of who you are as a Christian and as a man. You've got that gift of friendship and relationship, which is to be treasured. You've been a convener. You brought the right people together in the right ways at the right times for the right purposes. You've served the common good across Harlow as a Christian minister and as a good friend and pastor to many. Your heart for the gospel of Jesus Christ has been evident in all that you've done and we thank you for your faith and for your example in Christ. Uh, you've extended God's kingdom together with other Christians of all church denominations, together with people of other faiths, with politicians, and to brought them together to serve the common good in so many different ways for the benefit of the communities of Harlow. In uh, terms of the strap line of Chelmsford Diocese, you've been a truly transforming presence. Thank you, mate. I want to thank, too, of course, Chris. I hope you're listening to this, Chris, as well. Not just for being alongside Robert in ministry, but for your own particular gifts and ministries to us, uh, especially in Royden as church warden and in many other different ways. Together, you've been a great team. But Robert, as I finish, I just want to remind you as a Welshman to a Scotsman that in a week or so, Wales are playing Scotland at rugby once again. So be very afraid. But take care and God bless you. Hello and welcome to Virtual Sunday School. Today we're going to look at the Psalms. We'll look at one verse in particular and then a craft, a memory verse and then finish with a final thought. So grab your drink and a biscuit and let's do this. When you're stuck at home with time to spare can't go outside, you're not going anywhere Why don't you pull up a chair or pull up a suit Tune into Virtual Sunday School With a craft to do and a story or two Say hello to Nat, she's stuck at home too Why not tune in to Virtual Sunday School? So this week we are going to look at the Psalms and in particular Psalm 18 verse 2, which describes God as our fortress. First, I want to tell you a little bit about the book of Psalms. Psalms is a book found in the middle of the Bible and it's made up of 150 different poems and songs, mostly written by King David. One of the things I love about the Psalms is that there is a whole range of emotions found in them. One Psalm might be very happy and joyful. 
Then another psalm might be very sad and the writer is obviously upset. In another psalm, it might be thankful and praising God. In another psalm, the writer might be really angry and asking God some serious questions. But it doesn't matter what the psalm is, the person who's writing the psalm is feeling, they can always go to God. The psalms talk a lot about different words to describe God, that he is our strength, that he is our rock, and that he is our help. And in one particular psalm, Psalm 18 verse 2, it says, The Lord is my rock, he is my fortress and my deliverer. Now I like the word fortress because a fortress is a safe place to be, like a big castle. But of course we're stuck at home, which means I can't go to a castle or to a fortress. So I guess that means we'll have to make a fort of our own. <laughs>
क्रूस पे किया विश्राम क्रूस पे किया विश्राम मुक्ति दिलाए ये सुनाम शांति दिलाए ये सुनाम मुक्ति दिलाए ये सुनाम शांति दिलाए ये सुनाम नाम 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 यशु नाम 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 यशु नाम 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 यशु पर अपना खून बहाया क्रूस पर अपना खून बहाया क्रूस पर अपना खून बहाया क्रूस पर अपना खून बहाया सारा चुकाया दाम सारा चुकाया दाम मुक्ति दिलाए ये सुनाम शांति दिलाए ये सुनाम मुक्ति दिलाए ये सुनाम शांति दिलाए ये सुनाम नाम 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 ये सुना नाम 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 ये सुना नाम 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 यशु नाम 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 यशु In our sermon series, we are now well into the Book of Lamentations. So here is an overview of the book to help us grasp the whole. The Book of Lamentations. It's a unique book in the Old Testament that contains five poems from an anonymous author who survived and is now reflecting back on the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem and the destruction and the exile that followed. Remember the whole story from the book of Second Kings. The fall of Jerusalem and the exile was the most horrendous catastrophe in Israel's history up to this point. So remember, God had promised Abraham the land. He'd given David victory to make Jerusalem Israel's capital. And from David came the royal line of kings. You had God's presence there in the temple, and that's where the priests maintained the rituals of Israel's worship. And after 500 years of all of this history, in the summer of 587 BC, the city fell to Babylon. It was all decimated and gone. And so the book of Lamentations is a memorial to the pain and confusion of the Israelites that followed this destruction. Now, the lament poems found here are not unique in the Bible. There's lots of them in the book of Psalms. And these biblical poems of lament, they do a number of things. They're a form of protest. They're a way of drawing everybody's attention, including God's attention, to the horrible things that happen in this world that should not be tolerated. They're a way of processing emotion. So in these poems, God's people vent their anger and dismay at the ruin caused by people's sin and selfishness. And these poems are a place to voice confusion. Suffering makes us ask questions about God's character and promises, and none of this is looked down on in the Bible. Just the opposite. These poems of lament give a sacred dignity to human suffering. And so these human words of grief that are addressed to God have now become part of God's word to his people. The design of these five poems is very intentional. It's part of the book's message. So chapters one through four are called acrostics, which means alphabet poems. Each poetic verse begins with a new 
new letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is made up of 22 letters. Now, this very ordered and linear structure, it's in stark contrast to the disorder of the pain and the confused grief that's explored in these poems. So it's like Israel's suffering is explored A to Z and is trying to express something that is inexpressible. Chapters 1 and 2 each have one verse per letter, giving them a really similar design, but the themes are very different. So chapter 1 focuses on the grief and shame of a figure called Lady Zion. The poet personifies the city of Jerusalem as a widow, also called the daughter of Zion. And she sits alone. She's bereaved of her loved ones, devastated. No one comes to comfort her. It's a very powerful metaphor. And then Lady Zion speaks. She calls on the Lord to notice her fate. And through this image, the poet, he's showing that the city's destruction brought a level of psychological trauma on the Israelites that can only be expressed as the experience of a funeral and the death of a loved one. Chapter 2 focuses on the fall of Jerusalem and how it was a consequence of Israel's sin and was brought about by God's wrath, which is a key word in this poem. Now, it's important to remember that in the Bible, God's wrath is not spontaneous, volatile anger. The biblical poets and prophets, they use this word to talk about God's justice. So Israel had entered a covenant agreement with God, and for centuries they've been violating it by worshiping other gods, perpetrating injustice, oppressing the poor. And so, yes, God is slow to anger, but he eventually does get angry at human evil, and he will bring his just anger in the form of punishment. In the case of Jerusalem, this involved allowing Babylon to come and conquer the city. And so this poem is acknowledging that God's wrath is justified, but this doesn't keep the poet from lamenting and asking God to show compassion once again. Chapter 3 breaks this design pattern by having three verses per letter, so it's the longest poem in the book. And the voice is that of a lonely man speaking out of his suffering and grief as a representative of the whole people. And what's interesting is that this chapter is full of language that's drawn from other parts of the Old Testament, from the laments of Job and from other important lament psalms and even from the suffering servant poems in Isaiah. And the poet sees his hardship as a form of God's justice, like chapter 2 said. But paradoxically, this is what gives the poet hope. And it leads him to offer the only hopeful words in the whole book. Because of the Lord's covenant faithfulness, we do not perish. His mercies never fail. They're new every morning. How great is your faithfulness, O God. So I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will put my hope in him. So the poet reasons, if God is consistent enough to bring his justice on human evil, then he'll also be consistent with his covenant promise to not allow evil to get the final word. And so for this poet, God's judgment is the seedbed of hope for the future. The story of the Bible doesn't end here, but this very important book shows us how lament and prayer and grief are a crucial part of the journey of faith of God's people in a broken world. And that's what the Book of Lamentations is all about. And now our thanks to Mandy and Rachel as you bring to us our readings. The reading is taken from Lamentations, chapter 3, beginning to read at verse 19. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to one who would strike him and let him be filled with disgrace. For men are not cast off by the Lord for ever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion, so great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. 
to crush underfoot all prisoners in the land, to deny a man his rights before the Most High, to deprive a man of justice, was not the Lord to see such things? Who can speak and have it happen if the Lord has not decreed it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Why should any living man complain when punished for his sins? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's reading is from Hebrews chapter 11 verses 32 to 39, then from chapter 12 verses 1 to 3. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised. Who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword? Whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle, and rooted foreign armies? Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who tortured, refusing to be released, so that they may gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commanded for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of whiteness, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin so that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance and race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue our sermon series on the book of Lamentations this week, moving to the middle of the third chapter, which itself is in the middle of the book. As I think Martin mentioned last week, each chapter in Lamentations is what's called an acrostic poem, which means that in the original Hebrew language, the verses begin with the letters of the Hebrew alphabet in order. So 22 letters in Hebrew, so if you're observant, you'll notice there are 22 verses in each of chapters 1, 2, 4 and 5 and 66 in chapter 3. Well that's 3 times 22 because each verse in Hebrew is made up of 3 phrases. Each phrase begins with the same alphabet letter before moving to the next. Well I'm saying all this because it means that this third poem, chapter 3, is meant to be different. It's meant to be a change of pace. It's meant to have a different rhythm and to stand out. If acrostic poems are written principally to be easy to remember, it stands out because it's the central poem, the pinnacle of the collection, the one we are to especially note and take to heart. We are to mark these words. And today's reading, the central part of the central poem, marks a turning point when the writer turns from looking at himself to looking at God. In the first part of the poem, which was our reading last week, the writer vividly describes his personal suffering. And today's reading opens with a summary of how he feels. It begins, The thought of my pain, my homelessness, is bitter poison. I think of it constantly, and my spirit is depressed. And how true this is of 
any trauma. It nags away at us. It eats us up. We can't let it alone. But now the writer's focus changes. Yet hope returns when I remember one thing. Now, if you've been following this sermon series over the last few weeks, we can breathe a sigh of relief. At last, we come to something positive in this book. What the writer remembers is the Lord's unfailing love and mercy still continue, fresh as the morning, as sure as the sunrise. There are many varied ways of phrasing this in translation. For me, the words of a worship song written in the 70s stick, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never come to an end. What the writer is remembering is that God's love, God's compassion, God's infinite mercy are all unchanging and totally dependable. They are things you can count on when everything else, everything around you is falling apart. And as certain as we can be that the sun will rise in the morning, so certain are these characteristics of God. As certain as we can be that the sun will rise, so certain we can be that God will not fail us. And the writer carries on. The Lord is all I have, and so I put my hope in him. He's resolute. He's recognised that nothing else is dependable, but God is dependable. Everything is sand, soft, giving way, but God is rock, solid ground. Suffering can evoke two responses to God. Some would say, if there is a God, how can there be so much suffering in the world? If there is a God, why do bad things happen? And they may conclude that because most certainly there is suffering and bad things do happen, then there cannot be a God. Or if there is a God, he cannot be good and loving. But the other response is the response written here. The Lord is all I have, so I put my hope in him. In other words, when suffering comes, where else can we turn? When bad things come our way, when the doctor says, you have cancer, when the doctor says, your cancer has returned, and a stranger phones out of the blue and says, Mrs Smith, who was in our care, has passed away, where else can we turn? As the writer continues, we can almost hear his faith, trust growing as he stronger as he writes, the Lord is good to everyone who trusts in him. In fact, the poetry in the Hebrew gets even stronger here. Not only does each phrase begin with the same letter, which is tet in Hebrew, each begins with the same word, tov, which means good. So verses 25 to 27 say, good, 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 good is God to everyone, good it is to wait in patience, good it is to learn this from our youth. Good, good things come to those who trust in him. He will not let them down. So in the light of his hope that the Lord is entirely trustworthy, steadfast in his love and merciful without ceasing, the writer moves on to assert what our attitude should be in response to suffering. We have to wait in patience. Our affliction will pass. It doesn't represent God's final will for mankind. We are to bow in submission to God. We may recall Jesus' words in Gethsemane as his time of immense suffering approached. Not my will, but yours be done. Suffering, but submission. And we should accept it all, verse 30. Again, we may recall Jesus' words in Gethsemane when he prayed, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be handed over. How is it that the writer can respond in this way? Well, he gives the answer in the remaining words of our reading. It can be summarised like this. He knows that God is sovereign. He knows that God is sovereign. He knows God is merciful, that his love is sure and strong. He knows that God takes no pleasure in our pain. He knows that God sees the suffering. He sees the crushed spirits, the denied rights, the perverted justice. 
He is not a God who is aloof, but he knows. The writer had no foreknowledge of Jesus, but we know that in him we have a saviour who has become one of us, a human being, so knows what it is to be human and knows what it is to suffer. And the writer knows that sovereign God is in control. He writes, the will of the Lord alone is always carried out. Good and evil alike take place at his command. This is what it means to believe that God is sovereign. We're not far from the kingdom when we believe that God is good, no matter what happens. When suffering comes, when we are in the midst of it, we can be tempted to think that either God is not good or God is not good enough. Let's remember that God is great. God is good. God is love. God is merciful. God knows. God is in control. Above all, God is good. Amen. Let us pray. And following the earthquake affecting Turkey and Greece, a prayer for all who suffer. Most merciful and compassionate God, giver of life and love, hear our prayers and let our cries come unto you. We weep with your people. We hear the cries of orphaned children and laments of bereaved parents. We feel the desperation of those searching for loved ones. 
we behold the destroyed buildings. We see the devastation. We are overwhelmed by the enormity of it all. Our hearts are hushed, our minds numb. We pray for those who are seeking to find strength to help. May they know your grace and patience and strength. God of the universe, open their and our hearts to know your compassion. Give us a spirit of generosity. Help the nations that we may gather together to strengthen and help the aid workers, the medical personnel and all involved. In the name of your mercy and healing and compassion we pray. Amen. And at this time of renewed uncertainty we pray for young people and children, for local businesses, for those self-employed, for those anxious or suffering from mental distress, for those on the front line, for those at PAH, all the staff, for those in the care homes. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful and lift up all who are brought low, that we may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And we pray for those in especial need, including those who are ill. Merciful God, we entrust to your tender care those who are ill or in pain, knowing that whenever danger threatens, your everlasting arms are there to hold them safe, comfort and heal them, and restore them to health and strength, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And at this time of all saints, we remember the roots of Halloween, that we are comforted by knowing that there is a great crowd of witnesses, those who have gone before. And we pray for those who are grieving, for those who are bereaved. May they know that Christ Jesus had con has conquered death and reigns over all things, and that there is the great crowd of witnesses, those who have gone before us, those from whom we can learn and set the example of love and faith and trust. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
we receive God's blessing. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, who is the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. God bless and do join us next week on Sunday Live. In my wrestling and in my doubts In my failures you won't walk out your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, You are the peace in my troubled sea In the silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, You are the peace in my troubled sea My lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness to show